So, we're going to start with mostly spoiler-free, <laughs> I guess, discussions, at least in the beginning, about uh, Genso Suikoden for the PSV, or the Woven Web of the Centuries. And, uh... Even though I've been thinking about it for a couple weeks now, what I want to say in this particular review, it's about the order. I'm going to talk about the one thing that has bothered me, and we'll work our way outwards. It's not necessarily in chronological order. The translation. So this game never had an official English release. Uh, team worked hard in order to translate some of the dialogue. However, however, there is definitely a lot of issues with the dialogue. It's not necessarily grammatically incorrect. But when we're listening to what they're saying in Japanese, since there are a lot of lines in Japanese, and we compare it to the English text that we get, the word choice is really bizarre. Yeah, there were there were definitely some liberties taken. Chat making fun of the nonsense. They use that word like 12 or 13 different characters use that phrase where they're like, what nonsense is this? When, and it is just like, it's one of those things where I'm really curious what the, some of the original words were. We had the classic catchphrase of, oh dear, from the protagonist. And chat can spam the exclamation mark blue Donna. Um, I will say from the standpoint of dialogue, regardless if it was the translation or from the original. Exactly, exactly, blue Donna. Why? What happened? He asked so many damn questions and he, he it's like, is he thinking like, is he like most of the time he's just regurgitating something in the form of a question. So they'll be like, oh, you you've recovered this dagger and it appears to be related to a star of destiny. And then it'll go back to the protagonist and he'll go, the dagger was a star of destiny. And it'll be like that over and over and over. And then cue this kind of repetition with things like introducing the whole concept of the game, where you could go backwards up to 200 years, depending on where you're in the plot, but in intervals of 100. So either 100, 200, or later on 300 years. And you basically have to sit through the dialogue of them explaining time travel to like 80 characters. And it is, it is very derivative. It's like, we it basically became a joke on stream. Yeah, it's just like, and, and it's from the same writers that did Tear Creus. And in some ways, I think Tear Creus just handled the matter better. So the way it has handled in another game is it was touch the book. It explains everything. Flash of white light, continue. This one, it's introduce yourselves. Try to explain you're from the future. Potentially have to fight them and explain that you're from the future and prove it somehow. Then they go to teach you a technique, then NANI, and then white light appears and you learn abilities. And it repeats like ad nauseum, no joke, like at least 50 times. I think chat would agree that is not an exaggeration. It happens a lot of the 108 recruits. Um... I think what makes this game a little weaker in comparison to the other ones is, uh, well, one with the repetition, but two, the characters themselves that you recruit are not necessarily alive, which is kind of odd. I think that's the first time in a Suikoden where we can pick up a tool or we could pick up an object and that counts as one of the 108 stars because it was worked on by a character that was one of the 108 stars. So like that kind of breaks up the formula a little bit. But it also just means that when we go with some of the limitations where people in the present could go backwards, but the people in the past can't go forwards, we end up with like a very limited party. Yet somehow at the same time, the party composition, if you look at all 108 stars, is like hilariously high in duplicate classes. We had like, I don't know, I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but like six chefs, four blacksmiths, four craftsmen specifically for magic, um, like three traders, three apothecary people. And it was just kind of like duplicating, triplicating, potentially five times. So, so every time you wanted to learn a new ability for them to create a new item, it was basically another character. And so it was just kind of like, it, you're kind of rehashing the same kind of point over and over and some of the characters had a unique personality i'm sure chat will remember quite a few from this game 
But at the same time, it's like, did we really need that many? Sh like, did we really have to go back in time like five times to get five dishes? Like, really? So things that were kind of staples in the other Suikoden games, like war battles or collecting recipes or co collecting sound effects or window colorization. A lot of those staples that were in the Suikoden's are just not in this game. And, and I think just from that standpoint alone that I have to say this is one of the weakest ones that we've played. I mean, obviously, I have my own misgivings with Suikoden Tactics. But even from the standpoint of that, I just don't feel like it's quite a Suikoden game. Like, it tried to kind of take in, like, a six-member combat, but instead of having, like, 50 to 60 stars of combat like the other Suikoden games, you at most get 18, and a lot of them are just absolute trash. They are so bad. Like, there's always been tiers of characters in Suikoden, don't get me wrong, but, like, the difference between, like, a troubadour and the archer or the mage is, like, hilarious. We're talking, like, bottom of trash tier, to literally almost two-shot final boss levels of OP. Like, the disparity between them is hilarious. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of things that don't really work from, like, the transition from a standard Suikoden, you get 999 XP and level up, and it generally scales upwards. They tried to do it in a modern RPG. They tried, but they, again, they removed a lot of things, and it just got really awkward. We needed to hear for the fifth time how meat is better than veggies. Yeah. There are some characters, that, and then it's just like, okay, so let, let me back up one step. So I mentioned before that you can learn new dishes from chefs, which again was normally handled by just finding stuff in Suikoden in the normal gameplay. But now it's restricted to a whole 10 minute subplot where they teach you a dish which is frankly really unnecessary but from that standpoint too whenever you want to learn new moves you don't have like the standard rune system of the other Suikoden's you are a class the class will learn one move you have to go to people that are better than you in the past in order to train them and once you've trained a character in it then you can pass on the skill there are like five problems with it. We'll start with number one. Number one, that process is really tedious and it's not instantaneous. So if I use a skill by using the learn command in battle, it could take anywhere between five tries. So I have to have five successful uses of the skill to keep it for the future. Or if it's like the protagonist passing on one of his sword skills, like 25 or 26 different attempts to teach a single skill, which to me is like absolute madness of how much potential grinding there is. So take that into effect that there can also subclass and well, actually let's not go into that. That's its own can of worms. So let's then take into the fact and consideration that a lot of these characters just don't really have great options to be strong. So for example, even though we only have 18 characters, we get one like really powerful weapon and that's it per dungeon. So if you double up on any classes, it kind of feels bad most of the time. And you kind of have to take a little bit of a damage hit there. So that's a weird choice. Um, a third thing that makes some of the classes very lopsided is not only the unlock order of the skills being... It, it's supposed to be progression based, but honestly, it doesn't make a lot of sense for some characters. Um, characters like the Troubadour are essentially literally useless start to finish. And I think some of that has to do with a problem with one of the game's stats specifically. If if anybody has any idea what the speed stat allegedly impacts, I would love to hear it. We've had heavy soldiers in heavy armor with giant shields, etc. outspeed two ninjas. Like this game's speed factor makes no sense. It's not like the other Suikoden's where you have a consistent turn order, it's random. And the problem seeps into that when you're forced to use these kind of lesser characters, uh, either through mandatory plot reasons or through 1v1s that are very rude, I would like to state, where you could change literally no items, you could change nothing about your formation in terms of where you are in a 3x3 grid, and sometimes you'll double turn an enemy, sometimes you'll go first, sometimes they'll go first, 
sometimes they'll double turn you. And that can lead to some really lopsided battles. And generally, it's not in the game's favor. Now, the game overall is fairly easy, as long as you avoid the dud classes. As I said before, there are characters that just cannot do damage, either from like a stat perspective or a skill perspective. So, and, and honestly, from the standpoint of like how much damage we were taking from AoE attacks, pure tanks also were pretty useless in this game. We don't really have an ability that just let them full shield for the party. And I think with the, without the ability to use basic things that were in the other Suikoden's, which to clarify, are things like using an item menu is not allowed in battle. That was crazy. I don't know why they did that. It certainly made the lesser classes completely garbage. Um, you don't have runes you could, you could sub into. So for example, when we play other Suikoden games, we could do like lightning rune for bosses, fire for AoE, Maybe if you're feeling like you're really bad at the game, you water rune for healing. I'm calling everybody out, chat. Don't use water rune. Um, but from that standpoint, if you really want to, you could kind of customize them. So even if they're like a frontline fighter, they might have a sub ability of this, or you would at least be able to go like, oh, this character is like booty tier at rune casting. So why don't I just use physical enhancement orbs? For example, like double strike or I have my defense in order to do double damage. And all of those options are just gone in this game. So a lot of things that would have balanced out the game normally, even for having lopsided classes, is just missing. And I think that's just a big problem when you play this game. It just feels like it's like sort of a sweetening game, but it's even further removed than like a tier crease or a tactics where I, I don't even feel like the full spirit of the game was properly captured due to just how many things were missing. So, oh gosh. <clears throat> and so let's talk about why some of the classes are also not really all that great. Um, so on top of potentially really slow teaching rates, in order to unlock subclasses, which may or may not be better than the classes that they're using currently, more often than not, they're actually worse, sadly. But in the event that you want to fix a class, like you're like, oh, the character is a tank, but I don't think like a high DPS moveset makes sense for him. Maybe I want to choose something that unbalances the enemy or something like that. And you want to inject tactics. They put it behind like this ridiculous relationship system where you are returning to your castle over and over and over and over again. And you have to do one meal per visit to slightly raise whoever's in your current party or whoever you select with the other uh, favorite selection, whatever, in order to raise relationships. So instead of having like a unite attack that would normally be like this cool thing to symbolize the relationship and prove you've been paying attention in the game, it's just literally forced grinding, including needing to max out a relationship just to have the privilege to swap subclasses. No joke, we went through almost 90% of the game. We got one subclass. We could have had two, except we realized one was the troubadour and we're like, hell no. Why would we ever make somebody a troubadour? They're terrible. They don't have a single damaging ability, healing ability, like actually garbage. <laughs> just like actual garbage. So they unfortunately put in a lot of grinding that was not really inherent inherent in a Suikoden game. Like maybe the closest was Suikoden 5 with earning the skill points over time. And that's kind of like what you would kind of use to slowly build up your stats. Like maybe you could say it was there. But again, like things where you could add personal skills or runes or even just holding up to three items on your character. All those are kind of missing. So even though it does go back from a, uh, instead of doing like a four person party combat in Suikoden in 4, it does bring back a six where you could choose a formation, potentially four people in a line, two people on the side, everybody's individual. You can do that, but it's just, it's just not worth it most of the time. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, good luck ever unlocking the subclasses without a lot of grinding. There's also a couple of subsystems like hunting where you could do challenge modes. I think those were okay. I didn't like that they timed you per se. I wish they just counted overall number of turns, to be honest, over a timer. So if you're a bit slow in the menu, some of the battles may be kind of annoying to complete the first time that they're available. Like if you're fighting a giant dragon, for example. 
Um, you have a dungeoneering thing where you can send people off, and every time you come back, you get free money and free items, which is okay. That helps reduce you needing to actually go back and do uh, fights with other monsters. You get an okay-ish flow of income. Um, the problem with it is that it's kind of twofold. One, it's mandatory you advance the day every time you go into the castle. So given how many times you have to go back to the castle for events or potentially traveling back in time in the tree that is at the castle, for example, because that's the method that they use to go back in time. Then from that perspective, you are just like constantly forced to either craft new items or potentially get ammo, which was not really a thing in the other Suikoden's where you needed Magicite in order to cast spells, which feels kind of clunky and awkward. I did like it for arrows, though, where arrow you could still do your attacks without having special arrows, but you could use them if you wanted to. I thought that was like the only positive thing I had to say about the crafting in the game. Um, one big, big, big downside in particular is that if you're also looking to offset some of the class penalties, like a character is not tanky enough or doesn't do enough damage, and you want to actually upgrade your weapons. Uh, boy, was that an unpleasant surprise learning that weapon upgrades are temporary and not permanent. Why is that a thing? Why, why was that a thing, Chad? I really love to know. We, after finding that out, I literally did not touch it for the rest of the game and it was pointless. It helped in, I think, one battle where we did something early, like as early as possible. And that was it. We, we stopped using it at that point. I didn't use it for like the last 30 hours of the game. And the game was about, well, since I'm reading every dialogue line out, it's like 58. But more realistically, it's probably 40 to 50 for most players, uh, depending on if going for 108 stars or just looking to clear. But from that standpoint, it's just like, yeah. I just, I don't know. There were just so many weird decisions with the game where like it it had like a potential of being really good. I just think they really flubbed it on the execution. And I think that was really disappointing to see both from like a story standpoint of hearing them repeat the same phrases over and over. The absolute idiot of the protagonist. And, oh, don't get me started. Do not get me started on the plot twist, which we will talk about in the spoilers. Withhold your tongue chat. We'll we'll talk about one of the dumbest spoilers of all time. We'll talk about it. It was like the moment where I was like, okay, this game is just I can't take it. It's so dumb. But are there any other points I want to cover? The music of the game is okay. Um combat was below average. I mean, it wasn't like the worst turn-based game I ever played, but it was a really big step down from 5. And honestly, even a step down from Tyrkreus, where I at least got to customize some runes to kind of put somebody towards one function or another. And this game also allowed weapon swapping kind of like Tyrkreus, but it just, they put it behind a absolutely ridiculous grind wall. Just really unnecessary decisions that I think really hindered this, the flow of the game. When it comes to like other things like general impressions on like the villains and the protagonists, um, we're pretty dumb and you basically have the plot explained to you as you huh, what happened, why, dot 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 huh, like your way through all the dialogue. Like seriously, that was, uh, if we had gotten a counter for every time he said huh in this game, I think we would have beaten the Zasteria tutorial count. I think we would have gone over 160 times he individually said the word huh in response to somebody. So it definitely was kind of frustrating sitting through it. There are a couple of characters that seem to at least know the plot and they seem like moderately intelligent as opposed to the I don't know how to write smart characters, which sort of happened. Um, Villain, villains were disappointing. I can't go into the, I cannot talk about them without going into plot spoilers, but yeah. They definitely could have taken it in one direction and they chose not to, is the most I could say without spoilers. And by going the more vanilla choice, I was disappointed. Anything else I'm really missing, team? Oh, some things like the controls. The controls were really weird in this game. Like, I know it's a PSP game and all, but man, uh, whew. Some of the normal movement in the dungeon is kind of weird. Uh, some of the some of the menu choices are like baffling. 
I'm like, I'm honestly like really confused. I have never played a game where cancel is confirm. I don't mean just like the, you know, English versus Japanese swap the buttons. Like even in this version, cancel was confirm, even with the button already flipped. And then on other menus, cancel is cancel. That was really weird. I don't like design decisions like that. Like I'm just of the opinion that if you hit a menu button, if you have a confirm button, whether it's extra circle, it should be consistent whether it is that all the way through the game. And that happened a lot on the party formations. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on because you had to hit cancel to confirm. But if you cancel on the other things, you don't confirm. Just very weird choices, I would say, with some of the stuff. Um, enemy placement isn't random encounters. I guess it's something I failed to mention. So most of the encounters are allegedly dodgeable. However, some of the contact hitboxes in this game are absolutely ludicrous. So you're playing in a like really tiny dungeons in terms of like the PSP can only handle so much in a room. So it usually just ends up being a lot of narrow hallways. And even then, when you clear a monster, by like a character and a half, maybe two character widths, you'll still sometimes get sucked into combat, which is ridiculous. Couple that with the fact that you don't have a guarantee of going first can lead to a lot of wasted time. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have too much else to add other than, as I said before, I think due to the fact that it was lacking a lot of core features, it led to a lot of unbalance, both in good ways and bad ways where yes, there were characters that were clearly strong, but there are also characters that were so terrible that there is nothing you could do to make them usable. Like you could just absolutely ruin your party by putting in all healers and troubadours. There's just, there's no, there's no comeback. They will never do damage. Everything will take a million years, not worth it. So yeah, it's, it's very, very disappointing, I would say. The, the game overall, because we went for all 108 stars and we did go for all the hunts, we ended up like very overleveled, even though we didn't fight most enemies more than once in order to unlock them to appear in the uh, dungeon side thing that I mentioned before, where you just get money by sending people out. So from that standpoint, it was like, uh, may maybe the very beginning of the game was a little hard before you got like your AOE abilities. Maybe. But by the time you start fighting your first, like, actual named villain versus, like, a monster, uh, the game is, like, a total pushover. You should destroy them every time. If, if you are not swapping party members, the game is, like, ultra free. Um... Oh, actually, one, one classic thing that's not spoiler related. So, this game sort of has a convoy system, but not really. And that really sucks. So despite going through like six different Suikoden's by this point, uh, they still did not properly figure out how to do a convoy. So what do I mean by this for people not aware? So normally in a Suikoden, there are people that have to be in your party for plot reasons. Either they're helping you get into a place or they're negotiating something or they are being ambushed and you're going to save them. So they're added to your party. And the game sometimes lets you keep a character floating in case one of those characters appears when you've already had a party. Um, however, you're, you're not generally allowed to put them in your side party ever, which kind of sucks because there's a couple points in the game where you get like clearly bad characters. I'm looking at you all the healers where if you had just been allowed to bring in damage dealers and left the other people in the in the quote unquote convoy where they are there for story reasons, but not in your party. If they had just followed that approach all the way through the game, it would have been fine. But yeah, there were parts of the game in particular early on that were a lot harder than they should have been because they just take away three, four, five slots for some reason. It's like, hope hope you have gear for those characters, I guess. So that, that wasn't the greatest of feelings. Like, it's okay if there's like one or two mandatory characters, but there were quite a few times where we basically bother going through the formation. We put everybody together on the Unite screen in order to make sure they're paired up. So regardless of how they are positioned in battle, front row to back row, we put them in groups to determine whose damage is the highest at the end of a chain. But then every time we get a new character or every time the game decides, oh, you must be on your own for one cutscene, it basically like slaps that whole setup away and you got to do it over and over again. 
It's just things like that where I feel like the game wasn't quite complete, where it wasn't really thought through. Like, there were at least 40 to 50 times where we had forced party swaps, and that ruined us teaching skills. It didn't allow us to bring in our favorite characters. Um, it led to a lot of unsynergistic combos. Where, again, we had to just straight up replace people from our party because they were like, oh, they're not good with the required people at all. We need more damage or, oh, no, 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 no. These are all tanks. You know, maybe we need magic or something like that because we just lost our mage or something like that. So not super thrilled. So I guess if I had to summarize it before we go into the spoilers, do I think the game was worth playing? Uh, it was it was just OK for me. It wasn't the worst game we played of the year. It was far from the best. It, it it could have used more in terms of bringing it closer to a classic Suikoden, I think, to win me over. And it had elements of it that were interesting, but just weird issues start to finish with, again, their choices with the stars, where they focus their plot. Um, I mean, I mean, just think about how late in the game before the characters start saying anything other than, huh, what? I mean, that was like 40 hours in? That's, that's a long time to put up with the protagonist. Like, he's, like, normal in the first few hours of the game, and then after that, he just goes full brain dead. So, I, I don't know. And again, some of it's the translation, some of it is the game. Original script. There's no way it could be something other than what happened. But anyway, chat, overall, probably not going to revisit the game. I definitely wouldn't speedrun it. Um, I don't think I'd play another mod or translation of it. I think I got what I wanted out of the game. And I think we got to see at least where they were going with the PSP. But honestly, when it came to things like level design and everything else, I think basically every other Suikoden was better. Um, with the exception of maybe the Suikoden 3 level design, because that was pretty atrocious. Um, but otherwise, yeah, pretty, pretty low rated for me. I don't know if I'm willing to put it as the bottom one because of my disdain for Suikoden tactics. But if we're comparing it to this just versus the original five, I'm like, I... Mm, I don't know, like, would I want to get a quick and easy two out of the way over playing this game again? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> if I didn't have to read the dialogue of two, I think I'd rather play two. So yeah, it just, it, it could have been a lot better, which is disappointing. But anyway, chat, let's transition over to the spoilers. We have to put this in the final thoughts. Because my thoughts keep drifting to it. If we would remove Nanami from two, that's also true. So let's talk about the ultimate spoiler. The bathtub chat. The bathtub is one of the dumbest conversations we have ever seen in Suikoden. I'm flabbergasted. It's up there with, uh, wait a minute, this is a jail. Truly one of the dumbest moments of Suikoden that we've witnessed on stream for any character. So, the fact that they somehow forgot what boats were. Well, no, not that they somehow forgot. They, it, it explains it, but it's still really stupid how they forgot how boats work in like 100, 200 years. But the fact that like, they also don't know what canoes are or rafts or kayaks or anything in between like seafaring vessel and small thing when they live on a damn river settlement is ridiculous. Actually ridiculous. I can't believe they tried to take that seriously as a plot point. What a dumb plot point, chat. <laughs> Kirk hitting us with the nonsensical. Oh, Kirk. Kirk with the Suikoden in reference. No one tried wood on water, apparently. Apparently? Uh, just uh, uh, apparently it's been decreed you can't do boats, and they just totally forgot. <laughs> Truly baffling. The game tries to mess around with the concept of the infinity, but I'm gonna be real with you, chat. Tier Creators just did it better in every single regard. And you can kind of feel where like a lot of those same plot elements from Tier Creators of People are from parallel universes. This one, they're in parallel timelines. We have to explain the situation to them. So we have a plot device that it helps elevate it. In this case, there is not a direct object, but a white light of training. So I I, I don't know. It just felt like it's, if I had to just be, pick between this game and Tear Creus, I'd rather play Tear Creus again. Ben DeFerry's made it legal or something, put wood in water. He did. He did. It's really dumb. <laughs> it's really, really, really dumb. Uh, other things I didn't really like about it in general is that they sort of gave the villain a reason to be evil, I guess. 
But I really, really don't like that they took away the fact that the Vermilion Axe or the mercenary group you fight through like three quarters of the game end up just being part of this other big evil cult, essentially, and basically absolves them of almost everything. That, that felt really bad. I did not like that from the writing standpoint. I would have rather it have been like a war between law and chaos, which is what I thought the story was going to do. And then it was like, oh, but the chaos was controlled by law the whole time. Whoa, that was such a bad twist. Such a bad twist. I know, Dango, it, it, do, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, listen, they live in the river. Like, it, it's one thing if they were like a desert kingdom and something changed in the geography where they no longer had rivers. Like that, that I would like almost buy. I would be like, okay, maybe it did go away because no one had a reason to build it for so long. But it's like these, these stupid idiots that don't even like the main people still don't know how to make boats. Are you telling me that no one in 50 to 100 years remembered to just write it in a... I guess they technically confiscated the books, but they didn't pass it on in general. Yeah, and then they're like... And then like they know it's like what a floating fortress is, but not a boat. Like, this is like actually absurd. Like, just actually absurd. Like, at no point, no secrets were leaked. Just, it was stupid, Chan. It was, it was a very dumb plot point. It's forever in our highlights, so we can always go back to that chat. If you want to relive the first experience with the, what is that? Is that a bathtub? Cogn <laughs> Cognizant dissonance, something like that. So if you want to go revisit that, that's been immortalized. Both on YouTube as well as a Twitch highlight. Oh no, they, they did confiscate the books. That was a big thing. They just went around confiscating books. But then, like, but then by the point we were in the history, 200 years later, Ionia didn't control us anymore. So it, it still fails. It still kind of fails even in that plot point, to be honest. Because it's like, these people are already rebelling against you from 100 years ago. Why wouldn't the people from 100 years ago have then written books? Like, 200 years ago, maybe, when they were all one nation, whatever. But yeah, just after a while, it just it had so many plot holes. But yeah, it's just it's just one of those things where just not a not a very solid plot, unfortunately. Where they could have done a lot with it. They kind of did things where you undid events. I wasn't a big fan of that. Us resurrecting the town, for example, I didn't really like. Like creating the alternate history. And them giving us like 30 explanations as to what that means throughout the game was kind of annoying. I did, I did not like it. I feel like it then kind of took away a lot of motives of some of the characters to the point where we basically ruined their lives <laughs> unintentionally. It's very interesting. I definitely feel like a lot of the game's problems also could have been solved by just going back and killing him. Like... Like, what, what, okay, so, here's an example. At the final boss of the game, why didn't everybody just go back 300 years and then kill the boss then? Why even bother fighting him in the separate timelines? I don't think it really gave a reason. It was just like, oh, guess that's all I could do. I'm like, what do you mean? What, j burn the place down? Yeah, that's why time travel is always kind of a tricky subject. Parallel universes worked a lot more because they don't have to really worry about that as much. But yeah, they tried to rule of cool it. Oh man, oh man, those final party members in that final boss, man, they were terrible. <laughs> Speaking of which, yeah, imagine getting to the end of the game like, oh, it is the legendary hero of, of, of legend from 100 years ago who's so powerful, they single-handedly does like 200 damage on a swing. <laughs> Like, like, get his ass out of here. <laughs> Send one of our confident characters back. Be like, there, there you go. Why don't we just laser beam the boss for 3k? Show him how it's done. You know what's bad when our troubadour is possibly on par with the swordsman of war? <laughs> if he hits? Yeah, I don't know how he missed that swing on an inanimate object. That was honestly amazing. 
There, there are some things that should not have evasion. Hmm. Yeah, it just weird stats and as I said before, stat lines where you had like super tanky and super strong characters in a game where speed doesn't matter at all leads to some really top tier tanks that just function as fighters. And then you have really speedy characters that seem like they should get multiple terms to make up for their strength and it just doesn't work. It just, I don't know. There's definitely something wrong with the game. If, if that's how it was intended to be, I would be very shocked. It feels like one of those things where they just accidentally broke it on launch or something. It feels like the reminds me of SNES Final Fantasy, where nothing works as intended. <laughs> like evasion is a lie. It only works in some versions. Stuff like that. It, it had flavors of that, but it had no reason to be like that either. I don't know. You would, ha you would have to patch a lot, I think, in this game to, to fix the balancing. The Troubadours need something. They're, they're so bad. They're, they're hands down the worst. Until the healer class learns the ability to heal SP, the healers are also pretty bad. They're there for if you really don't go for all 108 stars or if you just refuse to do optional battles, which I'll acknowledge is like a purpose, but like why bring them when you can buy 999 medicines for like 30,000 potch and you get that much in like three battles towards the end of the game? And what's, what's the point? But anyway, Chad, are there anything else you would like to say about the game as we wrap up the final thoughts? If you can spoil whatever you want, we're in the spoiler portion. But uh, yeah, the bathtub thing was one of the dumbest things of all time. I'm going to remember that. I'm not going to remember necessarily a lot of the characters from this game. It doesn't help that a lot of them didn't really have any screen time. It was just find an item and do things there. Dango wants to say one thing. Lucery, best character, says the parameter. Poisoner, best character, says Chris. The Poisoner was definitely something. But Blue Donna questions why, as the Blue Donna command is there. Yeah, I don't think I really have too much else to add. Again, it was just, it was very average. It, it They could have tweaked a whole bunch of things without changing the plot, and it would have fixed things. They could have tweaked the plot without changing the game mechanics. I think it would have been a better game for it. <clears throat> hoping for something profound. Are you hoping for the Jesus line that happened in the, uh, in the random one? I don't remember who wrote that, but it was back when we were in the Desert Kingdom a session ago. Yeah, it was it was just okay. Like, would it turn me off of the series as a whole? Not really. I'd still give another speaking in a chance if they bothered with making more, but I think Konami's done with it, sadly. See, it was worth it, chat. I was gonna say, if nothing else, the review taught me how to randomize text from chat. So the proof it works. So people say really random things, who knows? Yep, Blue Don is just confused now. <laughs> people hoping for it to occur. That was once in a blue moon. So many haws. That's appropriate. So yeah, I don't think I really have too much else to add. Oh, it quoted me. There you go, chat, nice. Sorry if you see the ads. <laughs> I guess that was technically the last thing I wrote. So we know who it picked there. I guess we'll talk outside of the review if chat wants to actually see who said the quote. I mean, I know that's something I, I do in the autotype in the beginning, so I can point it out specifically. But otherwise, yeah, it's just kind of okay. I, I, I think by straying from what made Sweek It In Sweek It In, it just brought it down to average versus like really good or memorable. Still gonna rate it as one of the lowest of the Sweet It Ins. Honestly, I mm, I don't know if I'd rate this one above or below four. They're both kind of low for me. I personally did not enjoy two. So even though two was very mechanically sound, I really did not like the characters in two. So I still think two would be one of my least favorites outside of Sweet It In Tactics. So I don't know. It'd be a really hard question. I don't think I could place right now if I put four above or below this game. But either way, they're they're definitely on the weaker end. 
Yeah. Never played or seen a Suikoden, but I can tell this is one of the odd one of the bunch. Well, if you want to go watch us play through the other Suikodens, we have completed one through five. I highly recommend number five, as I said before. That was a genuinely really good game, out, even excluding from Suikoden series. Whereas I can say that that game was easy top 10 games I've ever played. I cannot say the same for this game. This game is just whatever. It is it is what it is. <laughs> But anyway, Chad, I don't think I have anything constructive to add to the the, the final thoughts and our review. I think we covered basically everything. Yeah, I just if they hadn't trimmed some stuff, maybe it would have been better. Very questionable dialogue translations on some parts. Very questionable. There's just certain words you would never use on a Konami game. And I saw many of them throughout and we talked about it throughout the playthrough. Yeah, oh dear, indeed. So for now, chat, let's go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube. So if you did watch to this point in the video or the VOD, I'd like to say thank you for going through the review. And if you watched the series, hope you enjoyed us bumbling through what we had there. But I think it's time to say goodbye and we'll be starting another series and hope to see you then.